This is paperwork. She brought paperwork. She thinks she's going to get to open this up and show it. I have Laura Worthington here. Yeah. So one of the great things about my podcast is that every once in a while somebody walks in and says, oh, this is what I do. And I go, that's a job? <laughs> and then they go, yeah, and I'm kind of retired. Wow, that's definitely a job. It was a job, a good yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. So, I still work a bit. <laughs> no, I'm sure you do. You're not. <laughs> I do. Well, in fact, you have a website and you still yeah. are active. But for the somewhat semi-retired, is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I've kind of taken this last year off a bit. You know, I mean, I've mm -hmm. done I've done some work. I've been working on, you know, particular typeface design. But um, boy, just with the move, moving to a different state after mm -hmm. living in the Pacific Northwest for right. 48 years. Wow. And, we uh, now know how old you are. Yeah, <laughs> more or <49. laughs> less. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, getting back to it at some point in time, though. By the way, for people who we just tuned in on this, she does font for makes fonts for a living. Yeah, which is incredibly interesting. In fact, she came in to look at some rugs. We were talking about rugs, and she points to the above and goes, uh, "That's my font." And <laughs> it was a thing that I had for Shanta Begay, and I'm like, "What?" Yeah. That's your font, and you designed it, right? Absolutely, I mean, yeah. And so when I use something like that, mm -hmm. and we order it, and we put it on there, it's, uh, A, are we, I, I don't know if we paid something to somebody. I guess we did, right? Yeah. Um, what it would be in this case is that Patrick, your graphic designer, has um, a subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud, uh, yeah. um, being a graphic designer, and right. that's part of their um, their offerings. When you have a subscription they have um, the Adobe Type Library. And so every time that someone pulls down the font menu in you know, Illustrator, InDesign, Photoshop, mm -hmm. or one of those programs, and they use one of my fonts, it syncs up and then basically I get, yeah, get payment for that. It's a little bit different than how mm -hmm. I make my money otherwise. Um, people are always curious about that. You know, how do you make a living as a type designer? Yeah. And um, it's kind of like being an author or mm -hmm. a musician. You know, you- So you don't make money. <laughs> I do. So. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's royalty based for the most part. You know, there's occasional commissions I do, but most of the time it's just royalties. Um, so, for example, if you were to go online to myfonts.com or um, Font Shop or, mm -hmm. you know, any of these other places, um, and you might see one of my typefaces and you go, oh, I like that one. Oh, it's $29. I would get half. The distributor gets half. Wow. In general, um, yeah. you know, the royalty rate ranges from like 35 to 70%, somewhere in there, but 50 is pretty, the, pretty much the yeah. standard. And so it's basically so you make a living streaming, mm -hmm. literally like a musician yeah. does nowadays. Yeah. And fonts are, are software, you know, so you're not, you know, it, it's always a funny thing in the, in the industry. We talk about, um, you know, people buying a font and it's mm -hmm. like, no, you're buying a license to use the font is, mm -hmm. is what it is. And so. so could you take your fonts? I don't know why you couldn't, if you own them still and make them into NFTs. Possibly, you know, it's funny because that. That's been a bit of a kind of an interesting thing that's come out recently that I haven't researched yet, but I've certainly heard of it. But I would think maybe. so. I mean, you're basically buying that software. Basically, an NFT is just a, a link. Basically. Yeah, it's a digital design. And yeah, it might not be anything different than the crying monkeys or some of the other oh, no, interesting completely. ones that they have out there. Yeah, well, yeah, and it'd be interesting to know if you own that component of it versus things that you may have sold or whatever, because... You know, who wouldn't want to have maybe the original Laura Worthington font design of such and such or a listing of these? I would think it would definitely have value. Yeah. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's just <laughs> interesting. I just pop when you talk about software and how it's really just software. I mean, that's kind of what an NFT is in a weird way. So yeah. there may be another revenue stream there waiting for you. Yeah. yeah. Mm, <laughs> interesting. And you've been doing this for how long? 13 years, 13 going years. on 14. Okay, yeah. so not that long. Yeah, and, and exclusively too. You know, yeah. it's it's the only way that I, um, it's the only thing I do for income at this point. Um, and it happened pretty quickly. You know, from the time that I designed my first font to when I hung up my hat as a graphic designer and became a full-time type designer, just nine months had passed. Mm -hmm. So it was a pretty, pretty fast launch. By the way, I wore this shirt because it has calligraphy I know, on it. I noticed that. I, I looked love through it. I was like, what shirt do I have that would compliment that <laughs> <laughs> it has calligraphy up here? Yeah. Which I want to talk great. to a little bit about finding yeah. out the difference between calligraphy and fonts and all that. But how in the world, okay, let's just start from kind of the beginning because mm -hmm. I want to know how you get into this business 
and I have a feeling there has to be very specific things that work for your brain to make this happen. Absolutely. That other people just don't have, or there would be people d developing fonts constantly. So where did you grow up? Uh, North Portland. Um, I was there until um, Portland, Oregon, I should say. I was there until I was 14. And then um, my dad was a digital design engineer at Tektronix. Okay, so what does that and, mean um, exactly? So he um, basically designed uh, software and um, yeah, just everything in you know digital design. Um, he did when he went to work for Boeing. Um, mm. Like here's an example of uh, some of the things that he had done in the past. He worked on some of the first uh, touchscreen monitors. Mm -hmm. um, did some stuff for. Um, yeah, like the different screens and entertainment centers that were in the back of the Boeing 777s. Mm -hmm. um, he worked in electromagnetic interference, which was, you know, determining whether laptops and cell phone devices um, interfered with the, you know, um, airplanes, computer systems. And so is that like mechanical lab. engineering as well? A, a bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he also he also put together little software programs. And that was that was really fun as a kid because. Um, you know, he built like his own mainframe computer from scratch, for example, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and made us like joysticks and, and built video games for us as, as children. And he's really so, early into that, right? Yeah, I this mean, was like in early, the 70s early, and the 80s. Yeah, was and say, it was at a time 80s. when, you know, I think that we must have been the only people in the neighborhood with a, you know, yeah. a computer like that. And it was a, one about the size of a refrigerator. <laughs> I'm sure. I remember in 70. No, let's see, 81, taking a class in computer electronics, you know, coding, basically, using a huge mainframe and all these cards oh and gosh, Fortran yeah. and all that stuff, and thinking, oh, my God, how does that, why would anybody want to do this? It's yeah. Like just <laughs> mind-numbingly boring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Clearly, I didn't see the future. Well, I guess I did, or I wouldn't have taken the course, but. Yeah. Uh, so, so he's an analytically kind of driven individual, I would say, right? Yeah, and very, I mean. Very technically, you know, like adept mechanically, too. Uh, sure. you know, he was one of those guys that, um, you know, he built us our own TV set from scratch. <laughs> and he put a key in the back of it, too. So whenever we would want to watch TV, we, we had to have the key, which uh, confused friends. And they uh, would come over, let's watch TV. Oh, I don't have the key to the TV. Oh, man. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, he could, you know, fix all kinds of things. And um, yeah, and so I'm uh, really adept yeah. in that way. And your too. mom, what did she do? She was a beauticianist, which yeah, was the you know word that they would use for hair stylist back, right. yeah, back in the days. But um, as, after I was born, that was it for her, and she stayed at home and she became a mom. Yeah, more of raised a mom. us. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're growing up, you have other kids, your other mm -hmm. brothers and sisters. I'm the right? middle. You're the middle, middle. Middle of two. Uh, yeah, middle of three. And how many of those turned out to be software engineers, mechanical engineers? <laughs> I'm guessing um, more than one. No, no my really? older sister, though, technically her degree is within the field of engineering. She's okay. a technical writer. And, yeah, okay, um, she, that makes sense. Yeah, she's a she works for NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and um, you know will write like software manuals. Um, <laughs> he does a lot of. Um, Seeing a trend yeah. here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then my little sister is a human resources director. Okay. And yeah, I just got her master's degree in that a couple of years ago. Oh, so, so. so when you're growing up as a kid, what were your interests? Were you interested? For, for us, first of all, I bet you had great penmanship. Yeah, that was really the, the thing for me. Um, when I was, I remember being five years old and making a bold statement in the, you know, in the kitchen to my family that I was going to be an artist when I grew up. And I remember my dad saying, starving artist, babes. And I was I don't know what you're talking about. I plan on eating. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> but uh, nine years old, um, fourth grade, we have this teacher who, um, she was kind of a hippie, you know, like long red hair and just... Portland. Yeah, exactly. Right. And she had taken this um, handwriting, uh, you know, like to teach a new handwriting program. Um, I believe it was the Getty Dubay handwriting system. And it's based off of italic printing. Mm -hmm. And the letters are not connected, but you know, they have this beauty to them that makes them look kind of like cursive. The idea that cursive can get really messy. And, right. um, and so she taught us that. And she just had beautiful penmanship. And she described it so poetically that I mm. was captured when she was first describing the italic A. It has this flat top this that gently rounds into this delicate chin at the bottom and swoops up <laughs> to join with this bold stem. And right. I, I mean, and I just was captivated by it this and i nine. immediately nine years old yeah. and i immediately it was like being struck with by a lightning bolt i said this is it this is what i want to do for the rest of my life i i want to do something with handwriting calligraphy i didn't know what that looked like 
but I knew that that was my bag. And um, from that moment on, every time that I would write anything down, whether it was, you know, taking notes in class or, or more like writing notes to friends, if Mm -hmm. I'm completely honest, I wasn't much of a student. Um, I saw that as this opportunity to hone my skill. And so they would get these beautiful little notes from you that were all (laughs) kind of a calligraphy kind of uh, designed. Yeah. That's so interesting. And so, and did you keep that up through high school? I did. Yeah. I, I, and at the same time that I was learning this handwriting program, my mom was taking, um, a calligraphy class at a community college. <laughs> okay. And I saw immediately saw the link between the two because yes. the handwriting style that I was learning is, is, is the same construction and letter shape mm-hmm. as um, chancery cursive, which was really popular in the eighties in mm-hmm. the early eighties. It saw this major resurgence and, you know, I saw those two things put together. It was kind of this perfect storm. And um, I just was like, wow, this is great. And so I did a lot of lettering of certificates and poems and, um, yeah, wedding invitations. You know, so you're making some money doing I was, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you set up like a little business when you were young? Oh, no, not really. No, you were just, I mean, I just it's people kind of knew you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was mainly for the school. You know, yeah. it would be, you know, the teachers or um, parents, you know, of other students that would, you know, hit me up for yeah. various little So they recognized it. Yeah. Yeah. And they were yeah. like, you, you should see what this girl can do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's so interesting. And were you making any other art, like drawing or anything? Or was it strictly calligraphy? It was strictly calligraphy. Cali- you know, that was really my primary interest. And I felt like doing too much of anything else um, pulled from my time that I needed to devote to this craft. Uh, and would you I spend like, serious. I was going to say, I can tell. <laughs> well, clearly it worked out for you. But would you yeah. do that for hours upon hours? I mean, I would usually, you know, like a I, piano times playing, where, you know? yeah, I would get sucked into it. And I still to this day have to be very careful anytime I sit down with a brush in hand because I can look up and an hour or two has passed and I'm not even aware of it. And when you do that, are you just dr- drawing letters? Are you making words or what happens? Letters, in that words, kind? yeah, sentences, usually, um, usually just words, yeah. you know, I'll, you know, um, just kind of play around with different ideas or different feelings. Uh-huh. It's usually it's usually an emotion. I I always have I a, a brush and um you know and paper sitting on my my drawing table and it's it's always out there. And anybody who visits my house, I sometimes forget to put it away. But it'll just be funny things. You know, it'll be like um I really hate winter time. Yeah. Um. Why is it raining? <laughs> yeah. Or um. You know, I want to go to Tombstone, or I'm really hungry, and it'll just be funny things like that. Yeah, just it's kind of whatever. Journaling a, with a creative essence to yeah, it. Yeah. And, and what do you do with all that? Just throw it away, or mm-hmm. you, yeah, interesting. Yeah, unless there's something good. Yeah. And then I keep it, and I have boxes and boxes and boxes of, you know, pages with you know lettering that I've done in the past. That some of it's you know like oh I want to hang on to this. This is a good idea. There's mm. a good idea here. And some of it is just like, yeah, this is just me doodling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Are they doodles or are they literally going, hmm, I think this would, could work like this? Both. Yeah. Yeah, it's really free form. Yeah, you know, I really like don't sit bit. down with a lot of, you know, unless I'm doing lettering for the sake of a design. And I know that, okay, I've, you know, I've looked at some of the lettering that I've done and I've identified something and I want to take this particular lettering style and, you know, turn it into a typeface. Um, then, you know, then that is where I get very serious about, you know, crafting the forms. And that's something different entirely than just kind of this free form, you know, like I, I'm just taking a break from life. I would almost think that when you're doing this, it would be difficult in some ways to delineate what you've done in the past and maybe made a font and registered or whatever and what you're doing now do you have to go back and go wait is this me doing this like a comedian you oh know, yeah yeah not listening to another comedian tell jokes because they might take some of it but yeah i, I could see everywhere that you go there you you know there you are i mean you can't escape yourself right yeah you end up recreating a lot of the same things and i think that to a certain extent that's okay You know, I think that um, you look at my typefaces and you clearly see my DNA imprinted throughout most of it. Um, I am very intentional when I go to design a typeface about, I usually like to do something very different from what I had previously designed. So if I just finished designing a script typeface, Mm -hmm. the next design, I'm going to stay far away from that. 
Because it's so much in your head, exactly. almost like an actor with a role. Yeah. You've got to cleanse the palate and go to do something yes, else. Yes, I want to do something entirely different. Uh -huh. So, you know, the Sean Toby, you know, that right. what you see up there, like that was a good example of me, you know, having just finished this Adorn collection, which was full of calligraphic mm -hmm. um, ideas and wanting to do something that was much more um, structured and just something very different from what I had tried before experimenting with new letter forms mm. because yeah, you can, you can easily find yourself turning into a one trick pony. Yeah. I can see that. Oh yeah. 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 yeah you get definitely. comfortable. You're right. <laughs> and then you create the same thing over right. and over again. Oh, it's so good. Oh wait, that's the same mm -hmm. thing. The same joke. I just don't. Yeah. And it feels good. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. like you've developed this, this rhythm and this muscle memory for it and yes. you have to divorce yourself from it at some point. So when you get, when you're finishing high school, do you know what you're going to go into or in college? Oh, this is a funny story. So I get into high school, and um, and by then I had done enough calligraphy that I realized that that was not exactly the path I wanted to go down. It would be very difficult um, for me to you know make a living as yeah, a calligrapher. I'm sure. And um, is that even a job? Is it? it? It is, but it's a very difficult, very difficult path to follow. Um, and it wasn't quite what I wanted, you know, it was like, well, this isn't quite it. And my friends would talk about college. And I knew that college was just not, I just wasn't a good student. I had some, you know, difficulties, I think, with, you know, concentration and learning. And, and, um, you know, I remember them saying, oh, you know, we're going to do this. And, you know, how about you, Laura? And I would say, well, I have the most useless skill on the face of the planet. And they would always say, well, you know, I'd be kind of like Napoleon Dynamite. I don't have any skills, man. Yeah. Oh, but you've got amazing handwriting. Oh, what am I going to do with that? It's the most yeah. famous last words. And yeah. my dad actually said that to me one time. He said, babes, I'm telling you, famous last words that you're saying right here, you're going you're gonna to regret having said that. And he was really serious about that. And he was the one yeah, who introduced me to the idea of graphic design. Mm. And... Um, and that was an interesting one. I remember um, my mom pushing back on that. Oh, Douglas, don't encourage her. Mm. If you, honey, if you do that, you'll need to get a backup career. Huh. <laughs> and my dad mm. would get really frustrated with her and he would start picking up everything around the house, you know, magazines and newspapers and mailers and saying, this is graphic design and this is graphic yeah, design and this book that. is graphic design. Graphic design is everywhere. That's not, you know, that is an actual profession. It's a career that right. she can pursue and she's not going to need a backup career. And, and he really, you know, was all for it. And he fully supported me in my interest in, in calligraphy. I mean, he, you know, built me drafting tables and he, you know, signed me up for a calligraphy class in, at a community college. And, and he really pushed that. And so I, you know, graphic design was my pursuit. And I went to um, Highland Community College and, um, and studied graphic design and and was introduced to commercial lettering. And I looked at that and thought, okay, that's definitely closer to something that I want to pursue. But that also felt a lot like calligraphy and that like there's very few lettering artists who mm -hmm. are able to make a living doing this. Um, unless you go to work at Hallmark and then you have to move to Kansas City to do that. Right, and, right. You know, um, and so, yeah, it was, um, you know, I and graphic design was fascinating to me at the time. Mm -hmm. um, until it became drudgery. And, you know, I had done it for long enough that um, I got to the point where it was just no longer interesting. And um, 2008, 2009. Okay, that, so that's a big you know, jump there. Okay, so yeah. we went from, Sorry. <laughs> from community college to 2008, nine. Yeah. So you became a graphic designer. Yeah. And you started working for individual companies or yourself? Mm -hmm. or Yeah, um, individual companies. Um you know, kind of started out more in the realm of, you know, production design. Um, and then, um, you know, worked at like different graphic design studios. Um, and uh, yeah. And then in 2005, I struck out on my own as an independent graphic designer, freelancer. Okay. And that, that was nice in some ways. Um, you know, it, it was, it was like anything else, you know, starting your own business. It's like, sure, you've got more freedom, mm -hmm. but you know, now, instead of one boss that you have to please, you have dozens. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was, yeah, it was, it was, it was good though. It was a good first, you know, step for me to, you know, gain some independence and to get into doing what I'm doing now. And are you doing this on the computer, the graphic mm -hmm. design primarily? Yeah. But are you still making, you're still working on calligraphy and oh, yeah. that kind of stuff? Have you made fonts yet? No. Okay. So fonts haven't even, didn't it come into your mind that, oh, I could do this too, fonts? It did. And um, it was something I thought about 
a lot. And I remember having a lot of moments driving, you know, driving to work and, you know, feeling like ah, another day in the office and I don't want to be here. Um, and <laughs> what I really want to do is design fonts. But I had no idea how to start that. I'm sure. um, this really wasn't at a time where there was a lot of information about it. I didn't know anyone who did this. I had heard about people designing fonts and really not making any money off of it. So it didn't seem like it was a viable profession. But at one point in time, I had a client who um, I was, you know, one of their freelance designers and they had another freelance graphic designer, uh, Charles Borges de Oliver, and he had designed a few fonts. And I had been sharing some files with him and he noticed, you know, one of my emails that I sent that I had this hand lettered, you know, signature, Laura Worthington. And he, you know, sent me this email and he said, hey, are you are you a lettering artist? That's something that I'm into. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, and he started talking to me about designing fonts. Mm -hmm. And um, and it was like, OK, this guy's making some money at it. Um, and he's an exceptional designer um, still to this day. He he did the lettering for the NBC Sports logo mm. that you see flashing on mm -hmm. the TV, um, amongst some other really notable fonts that he had done. And um, so he was one that really like, you know, kind of encouraged me and introduced me into that world. And without him, I don't, I don't know that I would be doing what I'm doing right now. So because he said, "Hey, I, you can do this. Mm -hmm. I do this." Absolutely. And what year would have that been? That was in 2009. 2009. Yeah. Um. So I finally great time to be in business for oh, yourself. Oh, oh, yeah. God, yeah. So really, what happened? Nobody was, wants anything. <laughs> no, I know. And, oh, you and want a lettering was, person to do something in oh, a recession? Gosh. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it was hard to it was hard to make ends meet as a graphic designer during I that bet. time. I mean, my income took a substantial hit. I think I, um, I went from you know making I almost like making half of what I was had made the previous year in two thousand nine, and you know kind of went through a period of just you know depression and just kind of like what I'm do sure. I do here? Yeah. And I was a print <laughs> graphic designer, uh -huh. and so um, people were really heavily moving away from print, and uh, web and design web, and digital yeah. design mm -hmm. was really taking over, and it wasn't something that I was interested in. It wasn't something that I was natural, you know, I, I had a hard time, you know, understanding coding and, and doing all of that. And I had wanted to do type design, but I didn't have the time to do it, you know. Um, and, and Charles had kind of scared me a little bit. His, one of his first fonts, uh, I believe it was Sarah's script, was, um, it took him 800 hours. And I thought, geez, man, I don't have 800 hours <laughs> to design yeah, a typeface. Yeah. Uh, you know, but Lo and behold, you know, I didn't have much going on anyway, and right. I did have, you know, quite a bit of time yes. to get into that. So um, I was teaching part time at Highland Community College. I was teaching graphic design in mm. the same classroom with the same. Yeah, uh, my professor had become my co-teacher. It was pretty wild. And he came to meet me, you know, at the end of finals, and I showed him the very little things that I knew in um, for web design. And he showed me some stuff in Font Lab, which is a software program that mm -hmm. I use to design um, fonts. And I went home just, you know, really invigorated, reinvigorated, and started working on my first typeface design that mm -hmm. weekend and worked on it as, you know, hardcore until I published it in believe it was December 23rd, 2019. Mm -hmm. Grindle Grove. Yeah. And so it took you from 209? To... Actually, that font only took about a month. About a month. Okay. But I'd already done the lettering for it. Yeah. Okay. It was based on some lettering that I had, um, that I had created years ago. Mm -hmm. And I was really smart about that. Um, and it's something I recommend to anybody who's getting into type design is, you know, don't learn how to be, try to learn how to be a lettering artist and a typeface designer at the same time. And what is the difference between those? So, you know, if you're designing lettering, it's meant to be a standalone unit. You know, it's a word or it's a phrase. Those letters work in um, in one static context. Like a block. Mm, exactly. And they're not meant to be shuffled or rearranged. Um, typeface design is a system. You know, all these letters have to play well together. They have to mm. work together in any possible combination and we know that's like what seventeen thousand. Oh yeah three, that was yeah if, if you had three, the three, three letter combinations three letters it's what seventeen thousand uh, or something yeah yeah oh gosh seventeen thousand five hundred and sixty i forget exactly yeah. the number combinations that you can cubed. Yeah. yeah that you can take which is three letters there's that many. yeah if you're doing like a three letter monogram yeah. which is what we were talking about at the time but you know even you know even within you know uppercase lowercase um you know, the Latin alphabet serves, I think it's 563 different writing systems mm. in the world. Mm -hmm. 
And so you have no idea how these letters and symbols and numerals, you know, how punctuation, how all of these are going to be combined together and used together. Mm. Um, you know, for example, we may not have like a QJ combination that we use, but there's another writing system that may may use that. So you have to design the Q and the J to look well together and not collide. Mm -hmm. um, but in lettering, you know, you have this beauty of, you know, you have like a, a static word or phrase again. And you don't have to worry about any of that. You can combine all these letters and swashes and forms to, uh, you know, like float around each other, you know, make all kinds of interesting and unique, you know, designs within themselves. So give me an example of a, of a word that you would do, like like Nike or something like that, or is it oh, more? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, in type, a lot of people will use the word hand gloves mm -hmm. as a common word, or hamburger fontsive, which is... Um, you know, and there's reasons for using those particular words. Those are common ones. Um, <laughs> I like to use the word uncopyrightable. It, it combines um, all of the vowels. It has ascenders and descenders. Ascenders are um, uh, lowercase letters that have parts of the uh, the letter that ascend above, you know, the, the you know, the the X height, I guess you could, mm -hmm. could say, um, such as, you know, B, D, H, L, K. Mm -hmm. um, descenders, which are, you know, parts that descend below the baseline of the letter, you know, such as G, G Y, P, yeah. Q. Yeah. Um, and so yeah, it's got all of, you know, it's got ascenders, descenders, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, some of the more unique forms. And so that's kind of the word that I like to work with. If I'm, you know, getting started <laughs> with, you know, designing a font, I'll use uncopyrightable. It's a really <laughs> long one. So people yeah. who do lettering should do lettering and focus on that versus typeface. Yeah. Because as soon as you get into typeface design, it's a completely different world. Yeah, it's um, because now again, you know, you you know, you're, you're doing this lettering. It mm -hmm. starts out as lettering, mm -hmm. but then you know, you take these letters and you scan them into the computer, and then you redraw them digitally. Mm -hmm. And then uh, again, you have to play with all these different possible combinations and make sure that all of these letters play well together, that they look good together in every possible combination, and create alternate forms and and do programming and things like kerning, which is um, the individual amount of space between each letter mm. or or symbol or or you know um, each. We use the term glyph, and glyph refers to um, you know it could be anything from you know a numeral, a letter, a you know symbol, punctuation, mm -hmm. you know and any of those things. Um, that's what a glyph is, and so you you know you have to identify you know basically like manually move together, you know, say two letters or, or a letter and a punctuation and make sure that there's the right amount of space between them. Mm -hmm. And that right there is a job in and of itself. It's <laughs> thousands of hours to do that. If you can imagine, you know, I'm looking at, you know, on screen, I'm looking at A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, A, E, A, F, all the way down the alphabet and individually, like, you know, adjusting this one to go like a little bit closer this way, a little bit further away that way. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a lot that goes into it. So how big is your community that does this? Well, you know, it's, there's thousands of people, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people who have designed fonts. Um, but I would say there's maybe only, I'm trying to think of what the last estimate was, maybe f only 1,500 to 2,000 worldwide who make a living exclusively by creating typefaces. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people... And when who, you say you create know, typefaces, that's different than fonts? Oh, or? it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of a... Um, it's, it's getting a little pedantic. So the difference between a typeface and a font, a typeface would be, for example, Helvetica is a typeface. Mm -hmm. But a font would be Helvetica bold. Okay, got it. Yeah, so it's a very specific... Um, uh, very specific version of it. And actually, technically, it would be Helvetica bold... 10 point yeah. and naming what point size right. it was. Got it. And it came down to the times of metal type. Um, that's where the word font came from. Because, you know, for example, if you were, you know, laying out, um, you know, a magazine spread and you were using these little slugs of metal type, you know, you had an individual typesetter who was picking right. you know, A, B, C, D and, and literally with tweezers and, and laying them down into, right. you know, into their little galleys and setting the type, they would have to specify from the foundry that they were getting the, you know, the typeface from, they would have to say, I need Helvetica bold 10 point mm -hmm. in order to lay out, you know, create right. this layout from the metal type. And that was, you know, but over the years, font and typeface have been kind of inter interchanged yeah. and they, they're, they're essentially the same thing. But now. I get it. Colloquially, they're, yeah, they're the same right. thing. And there's, so there's only maybe 1500 
people that actually make a living doing it? Yeah, and I'm guessing. Yeah. You know, I mean, it could be more at this point. And when I say make a living at it, like this is exclusively what they do. Right. You know, there's lots of people who maybe design one or two typefaces a year, and it's a supplement of their income to other things that they're doing. But people who are crazy enough to sit down day in and day out and who have the patience to you know, work on, you know, sculpting the lowercase a over the period of four hours are pretty rare. Yeah. I think you have to be a little. Yeah. yeah what do you have to detailed. be? Detailed. Yeah. What um, does it take? Part, part engineer, part, um, yeah, part scholar, part um, artist. You have to have a really, you know, really good eye for it. You have to be able to see minute detail. You know, you're working with, um, uh, you know, a thousand unit grid essentially moving, you know, moving little nodes around on the screen. And you have to be able to look at, say, a curve, for example, and say, oh, it looks a little bit flat. I need to adjust this node um, over one unit to the left mm. and shorten this handlebar here by two mm -hmm. units to the right <laughs> and and so on. And that that will make this letter form, you know, look better. That and, must um, translate through other things in your life. Yeah, I Clothing think so. or your house oh, or just... <laughs> I don't know. Looking at me, I don't know, but I would think. Yeah, I have like all of my clothes, like every single clothing item and shoes that I own are all cataloged. Yeah, and I would I, expect yeah, that. Yeah, actually like today, you know, before I came in here, I looked at my app and I yeah. looked through my style book and said, oh, which, what am I going to wear tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and picking it out specifically. I would yeah. think so. I don't know how you couldn't be that person all in because to do what yeah. you're doing requires that oh it's like watching paint dry yeah yeah well it's very i'll meticulous. be with your father no i think that's just who you are yeah you know that's why you're one of the select rare individuals you know 1500 or whatever in the world that are actually doing this as a living that's a really rare thing that yeah you, you know that you can do and accomplish i mean yeah do they have awards or anything for font Yes. Okay. Tell yeah. Me about yeah. That. There'll, there'll be different industry awards. Um, sometimes distributors will, you know, have awards of, um, you know, best fonts of 2022, mm. and, and you know they've made this list. Um, or you know sometimes within the industry there's, um, you know, different conferences that exist. Mm. Um, TypeCon is the North American conference. Um, A Type I is this international conference. Mm. And um, and then there's other design awards um, that are more through like the graphic design industry. Or they'll, they'll mention it um, and um, communication arts and, and different uh, industry magazines, you know, have their own awards that they offer. So I'm assuming Those you're known fun. through these worlds. Yeah, I've gotten to be jurors, um, a juror before a couple times. Um, and yeah, I mean, get, you know, different awards for that. And, and that's pretty that's pretty fun. I, the ones that I'm proud of the most are the awards that I've gotten for being innovative. Mm. And that, those are the ones that I like. What I think it's really tough to be original and, and to innovate, you know, mm -hmm. in, in our industry. That's, you know, very narrow um, in, in its scope. Um, so, what have you innovated? What is there one that sticks out in your mind? Yeah, um, let me think. The one that I won for that was um, it was, I believe, around the wallpaper patterns that I created. Yeah, which are also kind of a which font, are, right? Yeah, it's, it is a font, yeah. you know, and I'm trying to think of what the other ones were because there were like, there were a while ago that I that I won a couple of innovation awards. I believe one of them was for um, my typeface Hummingbird, which um, uses a series of contextual alternates. And this is where you get into like the programming of fonts. Mm -hmm. um, and contextual alternates is this feature that can be activated through any program like, you know, Adobe Illustrator or InDesign. Um, and what it what it does is um, it changes, it substitutes letter forms. So let me back up a bit. So when I was creating, I was working on this font Hummingbird, and it's this um, script font, you know, it's this cursive looking mm -hmm. one. Um, I, it drove me crazy that the letter E, mm -hmm. the lowercase E, you know, you have this looping form like this. And every letter that would come before it, um, I wasn't able to figure out how to create that letter E so that it looked natural when it connected to the letter that came before it. So where you would loop, say, like the A mm -hmm. into the E, you know, this bottom part of the, the A needs to drop down kind of low to loop into this E form. It would always, you know, the A would have to sit up, the exit stroke would have to sit up a little bit higher than mm -hmm. the letter E, and it would look disjointed. 
But in order for me to make it work, I had to have a different letter A that would come before any, any of the other letters in the alphabet, like the letter N or the letter D. But it would have to be a different form to come before the letter E. So it came into this programming problem. And I thought, you know what? I'm tired of compromising my designs with fonts. You get one version, one default version of every single letter in the alphabet, and that's all you have to work with. But then you can, you know, you can introduce all of these alternate forms. So I could have 50 different versions of the letter A if I wanted to. I actually have a font where I have 46 different versions of the letter A in it, which is frightening. <laughs> but um, anyway, you know, and then you can program, you know, I'm going to substitute, you know, whenever I type in the letter E, the letter that comes before it is going to substitute its form so that it looks like it's naturally joined and mm -hmm. naturally connected. So I went through and did that with this entire typeface. And whenever you turn on this feature, about 65% of all the letters are substitutions. And it all had to do with adjacency. You know, I want, um, and I started introducing rules. Okay, whenever I have any of these round forms, such as A, C, D, O, you know, I want the letter that comes before it. If it's a letter like the letter N, for example, I want the letter N to break apart, drop down, and swoop below that round form. Mm -hmm. And introducing kind of like the pseudo-random effect to it. So I had done all of this um, programming in it to... Um, enable better script joining behavior, and then also to create kind of this, you know, random effect so that whenever you would type something with it, it didn't look like a font. It looked like natural lettering. You would type the word banana, mm -hmm. and all three of the A's in banana would be different. I see. That's why. So and that's what I, and that's what human, I wanted. Right. More human, exactly, mm -hmm. you know. And, now um, we're back to AI. Yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, <laughs> and, that's a, and that's something that maybe AI could jump into would be, um, you know, to solve some of these programming issues because yeah. the amount of code that you have to write to make all of these things happen is pretty intense. I mean, I think when I printed out the code for Hummingbird, it was 38 pages long. Oh my God. Yeah. And it's very simple coding. I mean, it's, you know, substitute, you know, this letter by this letter when this particular thing happens, semicolon, <laughs> you know, yeah. like very simple, you know, and, and it's, in its way, but coming up with the, you know, how you're going to make all that work and yeah, then the concept. working through all of that was really tricky. And so I believe I won an uh, innovative award for that particular font <laughs> and doing all of that because that was pretty innovative and it was, it was challenging. Yeah. So the people that are in your profession, and what do you call your profession, by the way? Oh, what, typeface design. Typeface design. Font design is fine yep. too. Are they all kind of have similar characteristics humanistically as you do? Are they similar type people? We all pretty well get along. Yeah. Um, I, I think so. I think there's... I would think. Yeah, you have think to be very detail-oriented. and Yeah. There's a lot of people that... Um, it's not common to come from a calligraphy or a lettering background. In fact, one of the questions that I got a lot early in my career was, um, do you do your own programming? Mm -hmm. Do you do your own development? Do you do your own production? And uh, yes, I, I did for the longest time until I, you know, later on, I was able to hire an assistant to do mm -hmm. some of those things for me. Um, but a lot of people will actually come from computer science backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, graphic sure. design is somewhat common. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, the, the backgrounds that they come in. But, but I do think that, you know, the ability to, you know, the engineering side of it and the, um, you know, the, the meticulous, heavily, you know, highly, highly detail oriented part comes in it too. But there's something I think that's interesting when you get into the detail oriented part of it too. Um, and the, you know, the being meticulous and, you know, and really chasing down a letter form until it's perfect. You also have to have the ability to let things go. Mm -hmm. You have to have the ability to know when to quit Yeah, that's and like when variety. a typeface is done. Yeah. And there's also a lot of imperfection within type design that's very hard to overcome. Um, you have a lot of optical illusions that you have to create in typefaces that break apart any form of asymmetry. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to lie to tell the truth. You know, I think we were talking about that, you know, like the columns, the Greek columns, you know, where they're, they have like kind of a bulge in the center of them mm -hmm. to make them look like they're straight and not mm -hmm. like they're, you know, yeah. bowing in or the, or the steps, you know, right. if you have like a long set of steps, you know, the same thing, you mm -hmm. know, to make them look like they're, you know, sagging, um, you know, you know, if I put a, you know, on a red background, if I put a black square and a white square, you know, which one looks larger, mm -hmm. it could be exactly the same size, a white skin square is going to look larger than the black. I mean, you have these same optical illusions you have to deal with. Right. And then you have designs that don't work. I, you know, I would say that 
only one out of every four or five designs that I create ever see the light of day. Because you look at it and go, this is just no good. Yeah. I'll, I might get 30, 40 hours into something and decide it's garbage. You know, I, I might get lucky and only spend five or six hours mm-hmm. and then look at it and say, you know, these, these letter forms, it looked really great as a single word. It was mm. great as lettering. And as soon as I started breaking it apart, you know, everything just started kind of falling apart mm. and the concept may still be strong and I need to approach the design part of it differently, mm. but it might not really work very, very well. And I may need to, you know, toss that and let that go. And yeah. um, just like an artist, yeah, a painting scrape, yeah. you know, they scrape their paintings. If they yeah. And work. this is, this is kind of a funny thing between my husband and I, where, where we really clash and um, we get along really well, but where um, we have a hard time understanding each other is he's an auto mechanic. Oh, we're retired now, but, um, you know, Ford mechanic for 30 years. And he's used to fixing something and everything being fixable. Mm. You can fix anything. Right. And I'm used to being able to walk away from stuff. And I'm, I'm used to putting, you know, 20, 30 hours into something and saying, ah, this isn't going to work. Goodbye. Yeah. And he can't do that. Or he can, but he has a very hard time with that. And it's, so it's I'm sure there are times that he has seen something and couldn't fix it and go, okay, this is, I can't fix it. Maybe he still thinks it's fixable. Yeah. But I and mean, he can't do it. But I'm sure those have come up in his career where he goes, yeah. Uh, this, yeah, I just can't fix this. Yeah, probably pretty rare, but yeah, it's yeah, probably yeah. happened. I'm sure, yeah. I mean, I used to listen to car talk and you would hear those the two guys yeah. from Massachusetts go back and forth and sometimes they'd be like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't you know, know what to do with that. You know, exactly. I don't know. Well, well you could try this, but maybe not. But it's kind of funny. Sometimes you would you'd come to, you know, type conferences and you would see people who want to become typeface designers and you see them show up year after year working yes. on the same typeface design because they can't let it, you know, they yeah. they either don't know when to finish it or they don't know how to fix it or they they just can't they just can't quit right. it. You know what I mean? They they struggle yeah, with that. It's a problem for business people. Mm-hmm. They start no, it's true. <laughs> they start a business and they you know they know that in their head it's got to work, it's got to work, it's got to work. Well, sometimes they don't work. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and sometimes you, just, you have to walk away. And you just go, mm, yeah, this didn't work. I thought it worked. It seemed like it worked. Yeah, it didn't work. I can't make it work. Yeah. And then that's very important, I think, to be able to succeed in whether it's business, art, typeface, whatever, because artists have to do the same. If they mm-hmm. get into a painting that is literally not working and they can't fix it, because they have to fix things too, right? Same thing, optical illusion and something. Mm-hmm. They'll scrape it, get rid of it, and you know, the good ones will. The other ones, some will just put it out there bad. Not the ones I deal with, but yeah. you know, <laughs> at least I don't think so. But yeah. yeah, so I get that. Yeah, that's the art part of it. See, because this, which w- was what I found so interesting in your business is it's, it's a combination of a variety of things. Art is definitely a big component of it. Yeah. A huge oh, component. Yeah. In fact, I'd like to ask, have you looked or are you doing where you could take your calligraphy, not calligraphy, but your typeface or your font? Well, it starts out as calligraphy. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And turn it into art, art that you would sell on the wall or a sculpture. It seems like a natural, just an absolute natural you know? Yeah, and there's a lot of artists that that do that. Um, Letter Arts Review is uh, my favorite publication um, <laughs> for exactly that. Mm-hmm. I've um, I have like every Letter Arts Review um, uh, edition since you know dating back to I think like 1987. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's yeah, it's my my pride my pride and joy. I've got like this giant section and and I've had an article um, you know written in there about about Hummingbird, that typeface that I was telling right. you about that I was innovative with. Um, yeah, I haven't gotten into that yet. I, yeah, I, I could see so it, especially like sculpture. Into, I mean, sculpture yeah. of letters. I mean, oh yeah, and then a how lot you could take beautiful. them and put them together, right, to make other words using different fonts. Oh, absolutely. Well, and they're all your fonts. It seems to me, if it would be creative to you and interesting, mm-hmm. a natural, right? Mm-hmm. Complete natural to want to do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've done a like little it. bit of, um, you know, playing around with like illuminated letters. I think I showed you one that I created, you know, for my dad and drawing, you know, patterns and putting, you know, like letters together. Yeah. And, um, and that's that's really fun. But um, yeah, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of amazing lettering artists out there that create fine art and just spectacular stuff that's shown in galleries and I would think. yeah oh absolutely and and that is something that I've thought about doing and and I I might get to it now that I've kind of had a chance to take a break yeah you know I think for so long there I you know just was so you know nose to the grindstone and so many different ideas to work through and um think- yeah and it's it's kind of a funny thing I joke about you know when I go on vacation and I 
you know, I, I'll, I'll always say to myself, like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna, this time on vacation with my sketchbook, I'm going to draw a landscape or some plants right. or, and I, and I start out with that. And 15, 20 minutes later, I find myself drawing type all over again. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fight it's it. Like, That's I just what you can't do. Quit it. Yeah, exactly. I it's think so taking funny. like a sculpture class though would be invigorating and it might just click. You might go. Oh, as you, because you just do the same with clay. You'd be like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, here we go. Oh, that's not right. I mean, because yeah. a lot of sculpting is really attention to detail and the minutia. Mm -hmm. I mean, depending on what it is. I mean, there are obviously artists that are not. But. It's funny that you mention it because I have a giant block of clay ah. that I am planning on. There yeah, you go. I, I, I want to kind of create like a, you know, like a take like a clay block and just start out with like an illuminated letter and carve that mm -hmm. out of clay. I think that would film sculpt it. it out of clay. I think that also would film it. Yeah. You should, especially yeah. the first one, just to see where it goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. interesting. But, I, mean, I have one of those, you know, Elmo, the digital document right, projectors. Right. You know, one of those yeah, really nice, nice ones that I could do that. And with. so now you're still yeah. doing yeah. fonts and mm -hmm. things for clients, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, still. I, um, I don't get a lot of commissioned work. Um, I've done some commissioned work in the past. Um, I would think it'd be expensive to hire you. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it takes a lot of time. You know what I mean? Right. So um, a lot of people say like, well, how much does it cost for you to, right. you know, if I were to commission you to design a font tomorrow, what right. would you charge me? And I'd say, <laughs> starts at $10,000. And it's yeah. like, and it sounds like a lot, but it's a minimum of 200 hours yeah. at least to, to design a typeface. And some, some of these typefaces, you know, go up into the thousands of hours that you right. spend on them. They can, you know, they can take oh, sure. a lot. So, so yeah, you know, in order to make it worth my while and, you know, and really work through some of those designs. And then if it's a commission, the client is buying the rights to it outright. Right. I am, I am, you know, handing them that intellectual property and it belongs to them. Mm. And there's no um, potential for me to make any additional income off of it. So the, the fee for that is going to be higher because if if I design it and, and keep the intellectual property for myself and put it on the marketplace, there's unlimited income right. possibilities with that. Yeah, I would think you would never. So want you know, to give you can up. you shut that down as soon as you do a commission. So you right. tend to charge a little bit more right. for those. And your necklace that you have on is that's your yeah, logo that's my slash monogram. name. Yeah, right. My LW. Yes. Yeah. So if people are watching on this YouTube, come see it. Otherwise. I'll try to get a image of that and put it on the on the, so you can see it. Yeah. Yep. This actually is something that I um, have gotten into doing a little bit is designing uh, letter form jewelry. I would think. I actually um, signed a contract a couple years ago with the Danbury Mint, and they've um, started to create some of my yeah some of my letter forms into yes. into jewelry. See that sculpture? So, yeah, absolutely. That's completely sculpture. working in three D, and that was a boy. That was a whole new learning process. And uh -huh. It was very different than. You know, learning type design, um, you know, <clears throat> software wise was pretty easy for me. Um, learning how to do 3D, you know, create 3D designs. That was, yeah. Different. But you can very do Very different. Yeah. yeah. They barely. And, and I'm assuming yeah. that was created with 3D as well, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So if somebody was interested in going into this profession, I don't know why they would be, but if they are, <laughs> no, I would. no, I get it actually. But what would you tell them if you're... You know, you're reaching out to some young person out there who maybe is like you, who's, you know, starting out, in, you know, in calligraphy and really loves letters and is intense as, as you are in this. What would you recommend? Boy, I, you know, <laughs> if they, if they, if they can, I would, um, I mean, do it a little bit differently than what I did, which, um, you know, I, I figured it out on my own. And that was, a, it was, a, it was kind of a tough road to do it that way. Um, there are places that you can you know, Cooper Union um, uh, is a, you know, North American school that you can, you know, that you can go to that teaches uh, typeface design. Reading University um, in England mm -hmm. is another place. Um, KABK in The Hague in the Netherlands mm -hmm. is uh, places that you can learn. Um, there's also all kinds of different workshops and, and things like that that you can you know, start getting into attending conferences. Do I think you do any? Critical, of, do you do any of the workshops or go I, teach? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I taught for a really long time. I started. I taught graphic design part time um, from 2008 to 2013, mm -hmm. um, and then and then stopped. Um, you know, after I became a full time type designer, it just 
I, you know, I started becoming kind of out of touch with the graphic design world. It didn't make sense for me to continue that. And I went into teaching um, brush lettering and um, calligraphy workshops mm -hmm. and did a lot of that for several years. And when I moved to Arizona last year, I hung up my hat and I, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I, you know, I might, I might occasionally teach, you know, a workshop here or there, but, um, in, in the more recent years, I was doing workshops for Adobe Max, and mm. that was a wild experience, teaching brush lettering to 120 people. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, um, it was myself and a co-teacher, Debbie Sementelli, and we would take turns where, you know, one of us would lecture, the other person would be, you know, working throughout the, you know, the group of attendees, and we would have three um three assistants and, you know, to, to keep that many people going. And, and this is live hand to people. This is live. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, they would, you know, they would have these big conferences, tens of, you know, 10, 10,000 to 15,000 person conferences um, in at like the, the LA convention center or. And what would these um, conferences be called? Or these um, are... Adobe Max. Okay. So Adobe, Adobe Max. Yeah. And they were, I mean, they were fantastic to teach with. I um, taught for seven years mm -hmm. at, you know, teaching these workshops at Adobe Max mm -hmm. and, and it was such a great experience. You know, I've taught um, hand lettering to over 2,600 people at this point. And seeing that many different pairs of hands creating letters, mm. um, you really learn a lot. And, um, and, it's, and it's fun also to, you know, to teach people, um, you know, some basic things and really just sort of demystify the process and get them started in it. Because I think trying to go on YouTube and, and you know, figure out, you know, how we're going to, you know, it's... Um, just not exactly the best, you know, um, it, it, it can be tricky. And I think um, I've seen, you know, some YouTube videos and some of them are great. And some of them, you know, they they miss the majority of them seem to miss one of the most important aspects in teaching lettering, which is the physical element of it. The the act of creating letters is is very physical. The result is is visual. Mm. And if you're not teaching about, um, you know, uh, posture, body mechanics, um, you know, all of these things, that's what really informs your lettering. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, kind of an interesting story. Um, I remember having two workshop attendees that sat right next to each other, did not know each other. And they both held their brush the exact same way, you know, the same, the same grip. Um, they had the same posture. They sat, you know, over their, over their, you know, their lettering page the same way. I mean, they looked like identical twins in the way that they were working. And their lettering looked very, very, very similar, almost identical. Mm. And their handwriting looked very similar to each other's mm. handwriting as well. And it just goes to show, you know, how much that that physical nature mm. of what you are, you know, what you're doing physically impacts your your art form, especially with lettering. I don't know that it so much maybe with oil painting or or some of the others, um, maybe more so with sculpture, but definitely with lettering. And so, you know, that's something that I, you know, I think is really important if if any if anyone wants to learn calligraphy, lettering, mm -hmm. that they um, are looking at videos that that really tap into that particular part of it. Do um, you think that yeah. those two people being identical twins might have also had something. To do oh, they with weren't it. identical twins. <laughs> they almost seemed like it. It was, it was weird. It was a weird experience. Yeah. I mean, I took one look at them. You know, I, I walk up to the table, and they're both exactly, you know, doing doing the same thing. Yeah. And they're yeah. lettering. You know, like I said their lettering looked the same. And, and I asked them to do some handwriting, and I got pictures of it. And I, I just was so, hmm. it was so curious. But um, but yeah, that's what that's what I would say is. You know, um, get some. You know, try to get some education. You know, right. workshops, in in person workshops are the best way to go. And you can make a living, clearly. Mm -hmm. You absolutely yeah. can. But yeah. is it like, like for my business, it took ten years before you really get traction. Does it take that long in your business? I think it depends you have to, for each person. Because you have to have for ways to get it out fast. there, right? Though so you have to have yeah. a mechanism for people to find your fonts, right? Mm -hmm. You do, and I think. You know, everyone is different in this. For me, it was astonishingly fast. Mm. I um, built on six months. Built on twenty five years of teaching. Oh yeah, and exactly. Graphics, I, I mean, you know, at this you point, know. I I have I'm forty years into it. You yes, know, I'm forty years of a background of right. you know lettering and calligraphy, handwriting, and you know, I'm thirteen years, fourteen years almost as a typeface designer. Um, for me, it was, you know, I, I published one font and I, I was in this mode of like, I'm publishing one font a month. Ooh. And I, yes, I 
went through a long period of time where I would maybe get like two hours, two, three hours of sleep a night. Um, I remember, I remember <laughs> you were driven, clearly. breaking into tears and, and you can ask my husband, I'm not, I'm not a crier at all. And, um, you know, looking at a printout of, you know, this font that I was working on and it wasn't working and I started crying and I was so sleep deprived and, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I finally made it work. But um, anyway, I, six months in after I published my first typeface, I, the income that I had made from these typefaces um, through one distributor alone surpassed anything that I had ever made in a single month as a graphic designer. Mm. And I, from that moment on, I took a leap of faith. Yeah. And um, I'm surprised. My, you know, I, my husband, you know, was we we kind of had a deal in our relationship where you know we were equal income contributors. So I could not rely on his income to support me through this. And. I told him, I said, I'm, I'm quitting graphic design and I'm be, you know, going to do, you know, type design full time. And he was like, okay, you know, I trust you, mm -hmm. you know, and thank God for his support and his, you know, belief in me, mm -hmm. um, because it was a really risky thing to do. I gave up 13 years of a profession over a matter of three months, mm. three, you know, from, you know, this, this, you know, six months, I had one month where I did really, really well. And that was all I needed. And I started you know, um, basically passing off, you know, all of my graphic design clients to former students of mine who, you know, needed mm. the work and, um, you know, helped to hire a graphic designer to fill the role of my um, part-time contract job that I had as a designer. And um, like I said, yeah, I've been... So developing that one font and doing Oh, well. no, it was multiple fonts. Okay. Yeah, it was multiple. At that point in time, I think I had six fonts. Mm -hmm. And it was this one font origins in particular that really was successful, but all of the others contributed as well. And for the remaining, I would say like there was a period of time, two to three years after, where if I wasn't publishing something regularly, and when I say regularly, I mean within a three to four month span, mm -hmm. my royalties would, you know, they would, you know, as soon as I would release something, my royalties would jump way up and I'd be making crazy income. And then after about two months, they would drop, 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 mm -hmm. and I would start to kind of panic right. and get really worried about it. You know, like, oh my gosh, I got to produce the next, you know, I got to produce this next font. Like, it's got to be out there and it's got to be really, really good. And I was just burning the midnight oil, let me tell you. I mean, you know, um, and then, you know, I'd, I'd publish something else. And then after a while, um, the fonts just kind of grew legs and walked off and started living lives of their own. Mm. And as soon as I started seeing things in, in my, everyday life you know like right now when i say that i see my fonts everywhere that's not exaggerating or being conceited i literally see my fonts everywhere i, believe I it. drive down the road and i see my fonts on a billboard i see them on you know signs outside of shops i go into the grocery store and they're on packaging or they're a gallery on displays and i yeah exactly and i you know i watch tv and i'm pausing the dvr so i can take a picture of the screen because i literally see them what everywhere. does that feel like when you see that oh it's a trip it has to be right yeah and it's and, and i you know i i um, I always ask my husband, I'm like, am I driving you crazy yet? With all, oh, that's my font. That's my font. That's my font. <laughs> and he's like, nope, because I got to retire early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so, I mean, he's, he's thrilled with it. But um, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting to see that, you know, that I have been kind of, my designs have been sort of woven into the fabric the, of the fabric culture. of society and culture. Yeah. Yeah. And to see how influential I've managed to, to be on a, small level but on a level nonetheless i don't know it's a written word yeah you know do you see it on things like movie posters mm -hmm. and tv shows oh absolutely and how about clothing like this maybe this is one of your fonts I yeah don't know. yeah one of the one of the best ones that i one of the <laughs> ones that i like the most was, worn your font oh yeah yeah I, I've, I've seen it before i've seen you know i've seen my font be like logos on people's shirts and yes. you know and that's always you know i've never asked anyone to like hey pose for me you know but um i've been able to kind of go okay that's that's what the logo was, and then I can punch it into the, you know, into Google and usually pull it up. Um, but yeah, it's 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 been it's been pretty wild. The the one that I liked the most, movie wise, was um, I thought this is hilarious. The Joker, you mm -hmm. know, um, the really good one with um, oh, uh, what's his name, Joaquin Phoenix, yes, yeah, so who played fantastic. the Joker. Yeah. Such a great movie. And Mark Maron too. By yeah, the way. Mark yeah. got two minutes in there. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was a really I my know, podcasting really uh, idol <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so there's this um, there's this one scene where it's like Kenny's music shop, and it, you know like neon lettering yes. around the word Kenny's music shop, and and the word Kenny's is one of my fonts. It's voltage, 
<laughs> and it was a customer of mine <laughs> yeah. who, you know, like uh, took a screenshot of it basically, or, you know, like took a picture of it and emailed me and let me know about that. Um, the other funny ones every now and then is I'll see people with tattoos of my fonts on their body. And oh, that yeah. trips me out, especially I'm uh, not, yeah, you know, I have one tattoo and it's, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, I'm not, not so much. And I, I see that and I'm like, wow, that's really permanent. Does your tattoo have your font? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. it's, um. Yeah, a little little yeah. calligraphic mark. Okay, there I you had go. that done when I was nineteen years old, and um, and I knew, you know, I, I felt comfortable in doing it because I said, calligraphy is always going to be part of my life. So, so I'm comfortable with getting a calligraphic mark, and it was my own calligraphic mark. And was that? Did you do that as to say I'm going to do this, mm -hmm. and no one's going to stop me, kind of thing? Yeah, I, absolutely. It was a. Um, I felt of it as being like a dedication, and it's you know my only tattoo and the only one I'll ever have. Yeah. And it was it was sort of a dead you know yeah this this is you know it was kind of a ten year celebration. Yeah. You know I I knew that I was going to get a tattoo of that, and I waited until I turned nineteen so that I could say it's ten years. <laughs> it was like the ten year anniversary. Because nine was when you. Oh, nine was when I first got started. Uh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, you really were committed early on. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. I was. Yeah. I think about it now, and it, it kind of cracks me up a bit. You know what I mean? I think of it as being kind of funny, like that a. The little nine-year-old was like, every time I put my pencil or pen to paper, I'm I'm honing my craft. <laughs> yeah, you are. That's why you're everywhere when you see a billboard yeah. or the Joker or Mark Sublet's gallery with a Chanteau Begay thing. Yeah, yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah, and and, and Patrick has used some of my fonts and and some of your other um, you know pieces things before. I'm too. sure. I would think that people would find um, an aesthetic that they like, right? Oh, yeah. I like this designer's aesthetic mm -hmm. there's something that whatever it is i'm sure there's a continuum even though they're all different mm -hmm. i'm sure there's a continuum of who you are and how you see the world it has to be i would think oh absolutely yes. yeah it's no different than art yeah. yeah you have your own signature i'm sure and i'm sure people that are gifted in recognizing fonts and typeface and things would go oh yeah that's yeah that's laura's work for sure yeah just yeah. like the guy who recognized it on the joker right uh -huh. he took a screenshot and he goes oh that, i think that's her work right yeah <laughs> yeah, and he was like, "Oh, that's Laura's," you know. Yeah, which brings me to your your card. This is why you got to have YouTube guys to watch it on YouTube. Yeah. For those who don't, but she made this card. That's her insignia logo, and then I just all this, <laughs> all the things that she's done is it just crazy. So those who yeah, don't business, have YouTube, that's a business card, this, isn't that wild? This is like a five <laughs> fold out business card that has letterpress, every yeah, kind duplex of, printed two pieces, you know, like a yeah. sandwich together, glued together. Yeah, no. I had she, to create like a little folding dummy and have my husband take like a video of me opening it up to send to the printer to say this is how it works. This is what it should look like. Wow. <laughs> this is how, yeah, this is how it folds together. And she, you know. she showed this to me and I didn't want to take it because I knew it had to be expensive. And she goes, no, no, you can have one. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> So if people want to find you, how can they get, how can they find you on oh, Instagram uh, and your yeah. YouTube and those kind of, but what are those? Um, so LauraWorthingtonDesign.com is my website and um, I am LW Fonts on Instagram mm -hmm. and um, I, God, I don't really publish anything on Twitter. I just leave it at Instagram. Yeah. Know, do you do really any YouTube? Do you do any videos? Oh, I do have videos on YouTube. Yeah. And you can just punch in Laura Worthington. Yeah. Well, this will be there too. So yeah. you can watch this whole thing. On they're there. kind of instructional and they're, you know, they're a little boring, but, you know, I. Not if you're into I'm fonts. I'm really particular about how I put little, like, instructional videos together. I like to. You know, I, I usually record. Oh gosh, yeah. No, it's like I record audio and video separately, and then I, you know, and then I, you know, with the video, if it's you know, like I'm recording something on screen, I'm, <laughs> I'm editing out like any stray cursor movements. And, yes, yeah. yeah. You and I are yeah. exactly the opposite on that. Oh, you're you know, you're totally loosey goosey about it. Yeah, yeah. my videos I are one it. one shot and no rehearsing, <laughs> <laughs> and it is what it is. Not me. Yeah. Oh boy, we did this video one time for. Um, yeah, it was during the 2020, so pandemic, and um, it was for Adobe Max, and they sent a film crew to my house, mm. uh, four people, and um, and it was 12 hours of shooting mm. this video for brush lettering, and um, and if you go on my website, I mean, there's you know you you could look through like news and tutorials, and there's you know you can link up to those videos there, but um, yeah, it was I remember just even even having to say one expression, I would have to repeat it several times. And it yeah, was they wanted it perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But. it was me, not them. It was me, <laughs> but yeah. And so the big companies that have this Adobe Max, 
that's the big one. Yeah. 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 And what are the other ones for people that are? Um, I've fonts? done a video series on Creative Live. Um, let me think if there's any others. Yeah, the video series are just yeah Adobe Max and then in Creative Live and um, and then like I said, there's you know some videos that you can find that you know are on my own channel. Yeah. 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 Very good. Anything else you want to share? I think that's it. We covered a lot. Yeah. I've learned a lot. That's for yeah. sure. If anybody has like Adobe Creative Suite, definitely like go on there and and sync up every single one of my fonts on there. I get paid for that. Oh, you get paid for <laughs> Yeah, well, have them do it. So let's say that again. That's so <laughs> what they need to do. Tell me again what they do. Yeah. So if you have if you have a subscription to um, uh, Adobe Creative Cloud, you know, yes. go into Illustrator or Photoshop or InDesign or whatever your favorite program is, and basically like sync up. You know every single one of my fonts that's there you on go there. yeah you'll be able to tell it's mine yeah <laughs> i'm sure i'll tell pat to do that <laughs> yeah. yeah well i knew you would be interesting oh thank you um Thanks. because see you're an artist right yeah yeah, yeah. it all like i said yeah. it all begins with brush yeah or old-fashioned dip nib yeah it's just a different Quill, even way to see the world a little differently yeah is it bigger in certain countries like the asian countries japan i mean because they have this long what three thousand year history of oh, calligraphy yeah, and things yeah. is it are those kind of things bigger in the, those countries china i feel South like Korea? it really you know like there's kind of an equal amount of love throughout. around the throughout the world for that yeah, yeah yeah okay and it's something that's fun too is getting into like different non-latin writing systems mm. you know i think we talked really quickly about cherokee mm. um you know the sequoias um you know re you know kind of doing a a font based on his handwriting mm. um for the yeah yeah, and you did that. That was a fascinating one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was um, Tiro Typeworks, which is this foundry, um, type, typeface designers in Canada, British Columbia, um, approached me. They had done a typeface called Huronia for Microsoft, and, um, and it was for the Cherokee tribe. And um, they wanted uh, basically to take Sequoia's original handwriting. Um, the Cherokee typeface looks very different than his original handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, but they wanted to, you know, basically take that and make it into a typeface that would work with Huronia. And that was a whole experience because I had to learn quite a bit about, um, you know, we really only had like one example of his handwritten syllabary. Um, and uh, I had to really kind of reverse engineer it and see, um, okay, you know, what, what forms are he's, is he creating? How do they relate to the, the, you know, the language itself, you know, mm -hmm. the oral language, um, and how, you know, uh, how did he write these things? He must've written it with a quill. This is like in the 1860s. Um, and so, uh, you know, really figuring out like what common elements exist and do, is there a relationship to sound and, and so on. And then, you know, basically like going through and hand lettering all of that mm. and then turning it into a typeface. It was, mm. It was interesting. It hasn't been published yet, but I'm, you know, hopefully, you know, mm. get on there soon. And but yeah, that was a. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And that, and that was for the Cherokee tribe? Um, so Huronia was. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And this would, this would eventually, I imagine, be part of that offering, you mm. know, for hopefully through Microsoft and mm. we'll, we'll pick that up. But yeah, it's a, it's one of the best American stories never told, um, or Native American stories never told. Um, you know, Sequoia was a, Cherokee tribe leader and um, you know like again you know 1860s roughly was when the syllabary was created and he had seen you know different books and um, you know had seen you know this power of the written word and at the time Cherokee was an oral language only mm -hmm. and so he um, started developing a writing system he mm -hmm. you know he himself and it took several tries and he finally you know developed this writing system it consists of 85 different um, characters and uh, a couple of two of which are modifiers, and I mm -hmm. believe it's eighty-seven characters total. Modifiers isn't like plural, and you know. Um, and he was able. It, the 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 genius of the of it was that um, it was a syllabary, and there's only you know very few syllabaries that exist in the world. I think there's only six, um, meaning that every single character represents a syllable. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, um, the average person can learn to read or write Cherokee within a couple of weeks. Mm. Um, and so the Cherokee tribe became literate, about 90%, 96% literate within, I think it was two years. Yeah, they were the first to have a, yeah. to print a Which is a just, I mean, newspaper, what a genius. Right? Yeah. yeah, what a genius he was. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I just love to be able to be part of, you know, a tiny part of that story in a way yeah. to, you know, to carry that out. Are there any 
figures in history that have just the most beautiful handwriting, whether it's like a... Oh, yeah, you know. Herman Zopf. Okay. I think um, he was a principal lettering artist for Hallmark. Uh, um, yeah, he's just incredible. Um, yeah, and then there's, you know, a couple of others... Um, you know, Doyle Young, I, you know, and of course, some of the modern day, you know, lettering artists, Carl Roars and Brody Neunschwander and um, Iskra Johnson is an incredible commercial lettering artist. Um, one of my favorites. There's mm. just numerous. I mean, this whole world yeah. that I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lettering artists are amazing. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> what they create. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's well, I've learned and that's what this is about. That's yeah. why the our dealer diaries is uh, the stories that come through my my world and you're definitely an interesting story <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right so thank you for coming on the art dealer yeah, diaries you. and we'll go out and maybe uh eat lunch yeah that'd yeah. be good i've been worried about my stomach rumbling getting on the mic so. oh yeah all right i didn't hear it but a couple times <laughs> so i think we're good all right yeah, thank laura you. worthington thank you very much thank for taking you. the time great